Well, hello, Malt Shop Memories Cruisers. I'm your virtual cruise host, Jason Venner. Thanks for joining us once again. Sitting down with another legend. I know, broken record. Uh, tough to be me to sit down with all these musical icons. And uh, today is absolutely no different than any of the other days. Mr. Tony Testa of the Dupree's. Tony, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. So nice to be with you, really. You, you know, I, I was just saying to you before we jumped on camera, I really... It, and you had a you had a wonderful response, and I'm gonna I'm gonna fake key you into it here for our chat. Uh, <laughs> I, I said thank you. You know, I said it means a lot to to me and to Star Vista that that you take the time and the effort. You know, to to jump on a call with us, I really appreciate it. And you had a wonderful response. That's easy. That's under the heading of very very easy because uh, uh, just speaking on behalf of the rest of Dupree's and our organization. I think an integral part to whatever success we've enjoyed throughout the years has been not only our onstage performance and using that and uh, to the degree that we want to do it, but the other half of it is I think equally as important, which is hands-on meeting and greeting our fans. That to me is puts the icing on the cake because they get to Think of us not as only as artists, but people, and yep. we enjoy being with them. And the Mall Shop Cruise is always indicative of that. We have such a great time because they are hungry to say <laughs> hi to you. Oh my God, you're Tony Tessa. I was like, who am I? Who am I? You look behind I'm you. You're like, who? See you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hear you. It's impressive. And you know, we were we were just kind of bantering about it. There's there's something special to to music that's been around for 60 years, right? I mean, that's a long time for folks to, to, to not only consume, but to digest that music and really feel it. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the soundtrack, not to be corny, but it's the soundtrack to so many experiences in people's lives from, from first kiss to, to wedding dances, to, you know, to babies, goodness, to all, you know, on down the list, there's, music from from your era that that 50s 60s you know malt shop era really resonates and the fans i mean the malt shop's a great the malt shop's a great indicator of how popular that music still is and what do you think it is i mean you obviously have a musical background beyond just being a singer is there something special about the music what what do you think helps continue the legacy it's, it's multifaceted to answer your question it's not only about dupree's music because we are have that one little uh part of that genre, which is beautiful romantic songs and, and the orchestrations and so on. But if you think about the late 50s and 60s, the rock and roll doo-wop era, it's, it's a conglomeration of so many styles of music, street yeah. corner music, yeah. rockabilly, uh, you name it. Yeah. And, but the whole body of music has, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, it's remarkable. No other generational music has had the impact yeah. that the 50s and 60s have had. To that end, it's unbelievable to me. When we end a show with You Belong to Me, or start with Have You Heard, invariably, we look at, I think, audience, and you'll <laughs> see a husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, reach over, holding each other's hands, yeah. putting their heads together, kissing each other, and you go, Holy mackerel, look at that. It's because they are now remembering. Exactly. They're, we're providing the memories that was the glue that they experienced 50 or 60 years ago, and it continues down. Really, really well said. Uh, it, it's true, you know, and we, I've said it in a handful of interviews recently, and, and you know, artists and stars like yourself have been saying it. It's, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch people who are no longer in their 20s and no longer in their teens go out there on these cruises and act like they're in their 20s and their teens again. You know, it's, I'm guilty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. It's uh, it's amazing how powerful music is in that way. It really is. It's 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 fascinating to me that it can just and it, transport and you back. And it's ongoing. It, it yeah. seems to when when we were in the 60s. We heard, and people will tell us generically, oh, in the 70s or into the 80s, ah, that music will never last. And whatever. <laughs> 2020? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're still talking about it. I mean, and relevantly talking about yeah. it. You know, it's, it's, I was just chatting recently with uh, Jay Siegel of the Tokens, you know, and 
Lion Sleeps Tonight. You know, there's certain songs. I mean, the the sound of the era in general, absolutely. And many of you as, as artists still have very relevant places. And then you take certain songs and whatnot. I mean, and they they reemerge, right? I mean, sampling is such a big thing now. And a lot of people big sample time. from yep. songs of those era. Or, or like Lion Sleeps Tonight, the, you know, the Lion King gets re-released. And all of a sudden it goes back to top 10 in the world for a while. I mean, it's you know, that's a testament to, to all. That's of, why, that's why Jay that. Siegel is a multi-billionaire right now. Yeah. <laughs> he would tell you otherwise. He would tell you it's his job to walk the dog and vacuum the carpet today. He, he's, uh, he's one of my dearest <laughs> friends. I love him. I love Jay. I love him. Uh, uh, we're, but it's true. Know, it's true. And actually, that's interesting. We were kind of just chatting about that, too. I think it's what's very unique. That's not fair. What yeah, Maybe it is, actually. What I find unique about your era as well is how well most of the artists know each other. Most of you guys as bands and groups and solo artists have either toured or played in the same venues or there, there's a lot of relationships uh, within the artists. Oh, it's, it's a unique community. It really yeah. is. Um, again, not to be disparaging about younger artists where they don't have that same, I think, in my opinion, that yeah. same camaraderie or that love of each other and respect for each other. Uh, and I, as I said, it's ongoing and it's it's remarkable to be, whenever we're in the same uh, mm -hmm. venues together and the World Shop Cruise is a perfect example of yeah. that. It's like, are you kidding? They want me to come here and perform and I get to see all my friends too? <laughs> you know, and I think that is, that's one of the great things about Malt Shop. And it's one of the things we talk about a lot, you know, fans and artists alike is that, Fans and artists are like, artists are fans. You know, you guys get to go to other people's shows that you haven't, maybe you haven't seen them in a few years or a few decades possibly, or, exactly. you know, you get to go catch up on some of that music that you remember and you love. I mean, yes, you are an icon to many people, but you have icons as well. And I think- Most, most definitely. Right, and it's, it's easy to forget sometimes that the stars are fans too, and you guys get to see so-and-so that you haven't seen in forever or, you know, whatever that is. It's, it's, yeah. uh, it's really cool. It's really cool to watch. Uh, I, think, I think also, um, not the sad part, but the reality part of this is that I, I'm 77, okay? Yeah. We don't all live forever. Yeah. And the sad part is that a lot of our friends Yeah. Uh, falling by the wayside and uh, that's the reality that I think things like the mall shop cruises help to energize and allow people to remember and have such joy in it so thank you guys really listen we're we're not the malt shop cruise without you and I tell you what none of us are what we are without the fans you know I, I like to say that Absolutely. all the time that the malt shop cruise is amazing and it 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 attracts people because we have the Duprees and, and folks like yourself on the, on the, on the marquee, but we're all just performing empty rooms. If, if the fans don't come. <laughs> it's true. And it's, it's, it's remarkable, especially on the malt shop cruises that when these fans get on board, <laughs> it's funny. They lose themselves. Yeah. They become 40 you years younger. They don't have any inhibitions about what they're going to say and do. <laughs> they just love to have or a where. good time. <laughs> no, it, it's it's very true. It's uh, it, it's it is. I'm going to use a horridly disparaging word, but it's adorable, right? It's adorable <laughs> to watch. It, it's it's just precious to see people lose their minds. To your point, and all of a sudden they're 16 again. And, you know, Absolutely. this is the this is the dress I wore at my high school prom, and you know, I I just find that I find that so charming. I find that absolutely charming, and and I I I just hope you know what a great what a I hope I have that when I'm you know a few years down the road. I I hope we all have that, <laughs> right? As the old saying goes, it's better than the alternative. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> so if you don't mind, sir, let's chat about the Duprees a little bit. Uh, obviously, you were there. Talk about the Duprees from the beginning. You've been there from the beginning, um, but you weren't always necessarily lead singer. You were there in some different capacities. No, no. When I first started with the Duprees, I actually had my own band. It was a cover band, but we were very popular at the time because we were able to back up all of the other acts. And one of our favorite acts was the, the Duprees. And that's how I intimately got involved with all the guys. And they liked me because... Um, I, th I think because of my older sisters who were really, uh, fan they were fans of the, 
of music before of Sinatra and Tony yeah. Bennett and so on yeah. and so forth, the four aces. And uh, that's where my upbringing came. But that's why I had such um, an inclination towards songs of the Dupree's because Dupree's music actually predated them from the 50s yeah. and 40s. Yeah. So those orchestrations always intrigued me so that I had, that's what started that relationship with Mike and the rest of the guys. And it uh, it went on for a number of years. We and you were guitar, after. correct? You were guitar? Guitarist, yeah. Okay. yeah. And um, we parted always uh, after a brief period of time. The group was in somewhat disarray in the early 80s and Michael Arnone asked me to come back it, he said, can you fix it? <laughs> can, and, it um, yeah. <laughs> so it, for me, it was like full circle. And it's, I said to myself, this, this is where I started. This is where I want to be. And it was uh, a labor of love. Mike entrusted me to run the group, do the harmony of the arrangements. And uh, as I said, a labor of love. And uh, some of the original members had passed on, obviously. Yeah. So it was... Uh, how we an evolution, how we sure. eventually came to where we are today with Tommy Patillo. Tommy Patillo is with the group now about 20 years, but he had history with the group in the late 60s hmm. as a lead singer. Um, so that was that choice was easy when I reached out to him to come back because he was tremendous. And Phil Granito on, on first tenor and Jimmy Spinelli. These guys this is part of my joy. I love presenting each of them in a different way because they are so unique. They're so talented, so different from each other. But when we come together with our harmonies, yeah. it's magical. It really is magical. Harmonies are, harmonies are so tough to achieve properly. And it, but when it's done right and it, each person has their true, you know, I think harmonies, you know, this intimate harmonies can be very forced, right? Well, just find, get, get into this part, sing this part, but it's not right. my natural. Yeah. Yeah. But just sing it. It's different when you feel like the harmonies are playing to the person's strengths. And I feel like that's one thing when, when I've heard the Dupree's, you know, and had you guys on the cruise before, there's something about each of you feel like you're in your own pocket. And that's a term that if you're watching and you don't know that musical term, it means you're where you need to be. You're in your pocket. Uh, was it, did, it, I'm assuming that's what you're saying when you say you enjoy it. You're, you're finding ways to get every guy in his own pocket and then come together. You're all singing the parts you're supposed to be singing. And it's beautiful. absolutely, it's absolutely stunning. A absolutely right. Um, voice wise, Phil Granito yeah. is a pure first tenor. And I'm talking about harmony notes now. Yes, sir. Uh, because in his own right, when he does his Jackie Wilson medley, he yes. just floors everybody. Jimmy Spinelli is a pure second tenor, and he's great. I'm kind of like the weird one in the group, because I do baritone, <laughs> bass, and falsetto tenor. Uh, all the top, you know. Yeah, dee -dee -dee -dee. Yeah. And, that's, and that's a lot of fun for me, right? Because I'm all over the place, you know? Sure. But... Uh, the interesting thing, back to your point about the harmonies, is that Dupree's harmony is really different. And it's not, not to be, again, disparaging to, let's say, street corner doo-wop uh, singing, which is relatively easy. It's one, three, five, and you just sing in blocks yeah. and that's it. Uh, the harmonies for Have You Heard, You Belong To Me, My Own True Love are intricate and they're important. That's why, I've always been a stickler about consistency. We always have to make the, the sound of the Dupree's consistent because that's what people remember. And that's part of our joy. You know, I, I thank you for saying that. And it's a conversation that I have with stars all the time. And it's interesting that I feel like what a lot of stars, no, this is completely unfair. I'm painting with a large brush. What artists tend to do, right, is as generations move on, you take a song or certain music and you and you young it up, right? Whatever that means. And that's fine to remix a song. It's fine to change. But there is something about the way the song was done in the beginning. You, you know, there's something about the way the music was uh, at the very start. And, and I think that's something that, you know, people remember music a very specific way and they want to hear it the way it was when they first heard it. 
they definitely want to hear it the way it was done the first time because that's the only connection, the only conduit to where that memory was first created. And if it's not there by sound, it can't be by sight because we're all a lot older now. <laughs> Sights <laughs> are different. By, by sound, the sound of that song, the sound of that voice, the sound of that music is the, like I said, the direct conduit to that memory. And it's, it, it's you know, you and I have bantered a little bit about this. And I, I think there's something to be said for that music wasn't a, it wasn't a, the music wasn't a passing moment in that memory. Oftentimes the music was helping create that memory. And, you know, so the Duprees are living as a memory for people because it was helping to create that loving moment or this moment or that moment. And that's got to be kind of a cool feeling for, for you guys as well to know that, yeah. you know, you're the soundtrack. To, yeah, it's, it's, it's a direct throwback to when we think about when we were growing up, teenagers, uh, uh, and, and thinking about the burgeoning effect of this rock and roll music to whatever degree, street corner, or like I said, all different types, that everybody in the world wanted to be a rock and roll star, a group, a vocal group, a doo-wop group. And you, it was, it was so indigenous to the, the time, street corners with four or five guys chiming <laughs> up to whatever. And uh, it was so unique. Part of that was the, the kind of music that was very popular, like Daddy's Home, A Thousand Miles Away. Very easy songs, but very, Romantic songs, they're very fun songs, and everybody wanted to be a part of that. So it didn't matter the extent of your talent of singing, whatever, you were gonna try anyway, sure. especially if you were a young, good looking Italian guy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> There's only so many directions you can go in life and singing is yeah. definitely one of them for you. <laughs> yeah, we won't go into the others though. Yeah, yeah, we'll leave those alone. We're uh, actually, let's talk a little bit about about uh, about Tony Testa when he's just a little guy. What what got you into music in the first place? Who were your icons? Who'd you look up to? Um, it my first recollection of any kind of musical interest was probably when I was in the fourth or fifth grade. There was a um, uh, an assembly where they had these musicians come and demonstrate their their, their oh, um, cool. instruments yeah. and most of them were string instruments but the one who played the violin I remember I was sitting like in the third row my chest burst with the, the sound of this this man making musical stuff on this violin I had to learn the violin well short story <laughs> I was terrible as a violin player. The dying but, cat sound everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. But and talk about the violin. Why don't you start with something easy like a pickle yeah. or something? You could have gone to the flute or yeah, not that the flute's easy, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah the recorder. But then I, as I got older, uh, obviously with rock and roll, the guitar was uh, a very popular instrument. And yeah. uh, my, my father, my mother gave my father a guitar for some birthday, it was a cheap Stella guitar. I think the strings were about an inch and a half off the, 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 the keyboard. But I was determined I was gonna play it and so I'm doing it. And then finally my mom said, uh, you know, you wanna take lessons? I said, lessons, what do I, I can do this. I'm listening to the radio. Yeah, I took lessons. lessons when I was 14, 13, 14 years old and I hated it because I wasn't <laughs> learning anything. You know, they were giving me yeah. all this theory. Which I learned and... on my own later. All I wanted to do was listen to the records and play it myself. And I had a really good ear for that. So that's how I evolved as a guitarist. Nice. And uh, I, I was pretty, pretty good at it, I would say. But uh, clearly, that, yeah. That was my early days with uh, guitar and uh, music. And like I said, I think um, having my older sisters constantly playing this beautiful music. Yeah especially harmonies like the four freshmen and uh, four aces and stuff uh, yeah. that's what drew me towards the singing part so it it was a work in progress you know well i i see you over your shoulder there as do our malt shop fans i'm sure you recognize those couple of guys you got in a picture back there so there's clearly you're you're fans of uh, of some rat packers 
other <laughs> side. I was looking at this side. I was looking over your other shoulder. You got uh, oh. looks like Frank Frank oh, and Dino oh, yeah, up there on the yeah. wall. Yeah, well, I'm I'm a huge Frank Sinatra fan, obviously, and um, I think I've read almost every book on his life. <laughs> and it goes without saying how interesting. I'll use that. Uh, yeah. As a as a, a, a description of him. Uh, how interesting his life was, yeah. um, spanning almost six decades and doing everything from movies and recordings and uh, stage. And he was quite a character. To say the least, you know, and we were we were bantering off camera a bit. I feel like everyone who's in that 50s into 60s musical era either has a story, a memory or something about either Sinatra or Elvis. Like everyone's got a story about one or the other, especially if they were in Vegas. <laughs> well, they were two of the biggest right there, so. I tell you. Uh, so when you are actually, so you're, we're, again, we're, we're, we're dealing with, uh, with, with Tony years ago, when you, you joined the Duprees, um, so you come back, you said in the, in the, in the 80s uh, to right. help fix it, and <laughs> you came back as musical director, correct? That's, so you were actual musical director. And then you've been there pretty much from the eighties onward. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. And do, are you still musical directing? Uh, did you guys bring in an actual musical? You know what? Uh, it's absolutely. been an interesting transition. Um, when I first rejoined the group, mm -hmm. it was like I said, in a little bit of disarray, and there were the, the musicians were playing too loud, and the harmonies weren't exactly on. So it took. It took a while, to say the least, sure. to fix those things, especially the elements of the musicians behind us. Now, I was playing guitar, and it was uh, I, I had to use the guitar as a tool for segues, for rhythm, for timing, and so on. But as we progressed, I was able to get better musicians and uh, put the guitar down because visibly up front, it was just a better look for guys singing without me holding the guitar. And to that end, uh, especially for the last 20 years, my musical director currently is Mark Barron. Mm -hmm. And he's unequivocally the best in the business. So I hand everything off to him because he's <laughs> absolutely magical with what he does. And he's, he's, he's known throughout the industry. Thanks for me bringing him along, of course. Of course, yeah, well, of course. He's, he's Gloria Gaynor's musical director, yeah. and he's done so much. He's a brilliant musician and a great, great friend. Now, here's the tough question. Uh, you're, you're, you've, you've been doing, you've worn all these hats with the Duprees. You've been the, you've been a guitar player. You've been a guitar player, musical director. You've been uh, an MC. You're an MC. You've also are your lead singer. Is there, you're wearing a lot of hats. Is there one hat that in a perfect world you like the best of all of those? Um, the one I think I'm better apt to is when we're performing relating to the audience. I love the singing part, I love that. But uh, this is what I think is unique to the Duprees too, or the way I've directed the Duprees is that I don't cookie cut every show. Mm -hmm. I don't give the band a set list, typically. Uh, obviously, in certain venues, you have to. Sure. But about 90% of the time, I give my musical director, Mark Barron, I tell him, give me the first three songs. And then, because I love interacting with the people, sure. I always say the, the songs, the performance of the songs is the easy part. We know how to do it. We do yeah. it every time exactly the same way. Not the hard part, but the interesting part is the glue between the songs. And that to me is the challenge because I get to think about where do I want to go next? So I've uh, developed a, a whole series of hand signals. Like I'll be directing the, the end of a song and I'll go yeah, like this and I'll give my musical director a certain signal. Like for instance, I may go like this. You know what that means? Steal second. <laughs> It isn't fair. That's what the song people do. <laughs> or how about this? Have you heard? Got it. So a, well, how that, about this one? That's how he knows. You know what this one is? I I I mean I could I could guess, but you tell me. <laughs> why don't you believe me? Why don't, <laughs> yeah, you, believe why don't me? you believe me? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it makes it interesting for all of us because nobody on that stage knows where Tony's going. Even Tony. 
So <laughs> it, it makes it exciting. It makes it That's interesting. Great. And everybody's super attentive on that stage, sure. the musicians. And it makes it enjoyable too. Sure. Well, you know, I think that there's something to be said. It's to your point, you know, sure, the music is relatively easy for you guys at this point, just because, I mean, you've been doing these songs for, you know, some of you guys 20 years, some of you guys 60 years, right? You've been performing this music, doing these songs. So that's, that's automatically going to be the easier, and I don't mean any disrespect, but to your point, no. the easier of the two, right? making, creating a great show. I mean, there's lots of artists, there's lots of musicians that aren't and I, again, I, I hate to say this live, but they're just not good live, right? They're not as good in front of a live audience. And that's for a, a myriad reasons, but you know, it's just not as entertaining or it's not as engaging, you know? And it, it's, I love that you guys keep it that fresh every time, or it, you know, when you can at least, it, it's about the audience. Totally. And to that point, it's interesting, um, invariably, we have great, great fans. They will come to multiple shows. They'll see us on a Friday and they'll come and see us on that next evening someplace or the very next week. And I would, would say, we just, you know, we just performed. Yeah. How come you're still here? Oh, no, no, no. This is, you guys are great. Um, and they'll say after the show, this was the best show you ever did. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, well, the music's the same. You yeah, know, the performances yeah. are the same. Yeah. So what is it? I know what it is. It's because we're able to relate to them. And it's the that's the magic of live entertainment, right? The magic of yeah. live entertainment is is breaking down the fourth wall. And for, for folks watching that don't know, the fourth wall is the imaginary wall that separates the stage from the crowd. And it's it's what there's a fourth wall when we watch TV, right? That's happening on TV. We're the audience watching. We're not actually participating as an audience. That's right. But when an artist can punch through that wall and create an interactive show where the audience can have a comment that dictates the direction of the show, or you can ask a question that dictates certain things, you know, and certain happenings, that that makes it that, that makes it a different experience for an audience. And that I love that you guys do that. That's fantastic. A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Now, in a perfect world, if you have no limits, what's the length of a Dupree's show? If you have no time cap? Typically, um, when we when headline in Atlantic City or in Las Vegas, we're going to be there twice next year, as a matter of fact. Um, it's a 90-minute show. 90 minutes. I'd say it's relegated to the venue and their time yeah. frame. That's but, what I'm saying. If there is no time frame, what do you guys, if, if, if Atlantic City just said, You've got six hours. Play as much as you want. Oh, what would be the ideal? 90, at least 90, 90. minutes. Um, close to two hours sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it, it's really dependent on, and again, this is the um, undefinable thing. Mm -hmm. You want to keep the audience interest. Sometimes you have to keep it to an hour. Because, You'll feel it. You can you know, feel they're, it. They're not, they're not yeah. into it. Or it's, it's the type of venue where there's mm -hmm. interactivity not people sitting in, in seats watching yeah. us, but some other kind. You have to be aware of where you are. So, um, yeah, I mean, we'll go on forever if, if they like it. <laughs> <laughs> and and not to selflessly turn it back around, but what's it like being on the malt shop stage with that crowd? I know we talked about it a little bit in the beginning. It's, but... it's magical. It's absolutely yeah. magical. Like I, I said earlier, these people are crazy. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're fans. They, they get on that ship from land. And they turn into teenagers and there are no limits to what they could say, what they could do. They are just one happy bunch and they love having fun with everybody's, everybody else is on the same wavelength. Yeah. So they go see one star and they'll enjoy the heck out of it. Go to see somebody else. They'll see them on the deck and uh, stop and talk <laughs> with them. It's so much fun. It really what is. are they? What are they like as a crowd for your shows? I mean, if you're selfishly speaking here, when you guys are on stage looking out, I mean, I feel like the Malt Shop's a pretty knowledgeable group. They know their oh. music. They know your music. They know the words. They know the requests. They know what they want to hear. They've got to be a fairly interactive group for you guys. Totally, totally, and and we can tell that too. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I'll say, yeah, I noticed that you, you guys are really great, and you're singing along. I'd say. Can you keep it down? Because I'm yeah. trying to hear our voices. <laughs> no, seriously, oh, they man. are. And that, what's better than that? Them yeah. singing along with us and yeah. enjoying it, the music? 
it's pretty magical out there. It certainly is that. So I'm going to shift gears on you a little bit here. Obviously, we're all going through the same thing out here in this world. We're all dealing with pandemics and social distancing. And, you know, with that, we've we've don't have the ability or very rarely have the ability to to be on stage and do anything live at the moment. When's the yeah. last guy, when's the last time that the Dupree's performed? It, uh, we we were in the Atlantic City. We headlined there on February, it was during yeah. Valentine's Day. Yeah. And then we performed in Philadelphia the very next night, uh, around the 16th or so of, of February. February. And that was it. Eight that months. was it, yeah. Is it, is it, uh, <clears throat> is the vacation well deserved, well needed, and you're still appreciating it, or are you to the well, point where in, you're like, okay, my, we can get back to case, stage now? <laughs> in my case, it was uh, actually a blessing in disguise yeah. because I was suffering from a bad hip that oh, I'm sorry. I had. Yeah. I had planned to get um, a replacement for okay. months and months and months. COVID hit. Then, of course, everything was on hold with that as well. So it wasn't until June that I actually had a full hip replacement. Oh, so nice. I was able to recuperate and, and get back to 100%. So How that you was, like I said, blessing in disguise. Are, are you feeling good on it? You feeling? Oh, yeah. Feel... Back, it's back to normal. Oh, that's I awesome. Think, I think I'm actually taller. <laughs> just on one side, though? Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> Picked up a couple inches on just that one side. <laughs> I could use all the height I can get. Listen, uh, so, well, that well, a uh, that's wonderful. I'm congratulations. I'm glad you got that opportunity. But on the downside of it, I mean, obviously, you guys got to be itching to get back on stage here at at some point. Yeah, it, it, well, we all are. This this yeah. industry is not only relegated to us in this um, oldies world. Yeah. I mean, Broadway. I mean, all these I artists. Know. All these venues in Las Vegas, in Atlantic City, they're just dark right now. It's, it's crazy. And um, it's tough. It's tough on everybody, not, not even entertainers, but the people who yeah. service these venues, the yeah. service people, the, the, the techs. I mean, it's, it's right up and down the line. I'm really, glad you, I'm really glad you said that because it's, it's true. And, you know, we're not, not to lament all of it, obviously, but... It, I think it's often we, we think, oh, the entertainers, which we should, but there is an entire industry totally. behind those entertainers from lights and sound yeah. and texts and all the things that, you know, and all the people, ticket sales and, you know, people working ushers and there's, there's, there's millions of people that are affected beyond, no offense, just the stars, you know, and it's absolutely, it's absolutely. So, uh, so I got to ask, have you picked up any interesting or fun hobbies during this time? Uh, uh, <laughs> What's keeping you busy? Probably nothing that you would find interesting, but listen, um, our, our audience loves it all. Tell us. My, in, in years years ago, I was self taught as a programmer, oh. and I did a lot of work. As a matter of fact, I used to as an outside consultant. This was in the early late nineties, around that period of time, and I had such a blast doing it. As a matter of fact, I can probably say I wrote all the worldwide templates, office templates for Merck Pharmaceutical. Oh. And it, it was great fun, but then an interesting thing happened, which was coincidental to me not doing that anymore. They outsourced to programmers in Bangladesh or wherever sure, they went. Yeah. So as an interesting thing that I've been doing, my girlfriend is actually an office manager for our daughter, who's an eye doctor. And they, they're a little antiquated with some of their office um, procedures. So I went about automating put it in a nutshell, a whole bunch of templates that make wow. her life easier. And again, it was just so much fun to do. So that's the most productive thing I've heard a star say that they've done <laughs> with their time during COVID. Usually we get, well, I walk the dog a lot. Well, uh, you know, a couple of our friends are, are flight simulators and, you know, get into <laughs> things like that. And yeah. well, I write templates that make the world go round. <laughs> you're, you're winning. You're winning right now. Tony. Well, it, it, it's interesting. <laughs> it's it's really interesting stuff. Yeah, and I, I always got the thrill when I was programming that somebody was asking me to create a template for a certain purpose. I thought you you're asking me to do that. I, that's so, and I got paid for it too, which was great. You know, absolutely. And and I've got to ask. Obviously, uh, we were chatting a little bit before. You have a beautiful family. We see them back there on the wall behind you. And I think that's your granddaughter up there. How many grandkids do you have, Tony? 
I have two granddaughters. One is 27. The other one is uh, in our final year at Loyola. She's going to be a nice. brilliant uh, attorney. Nice. And that's with my daughter. My son is uh, just turned 40, is married, and uh, his beautiful wife, they just got a brand new baby, Cecilia. Oh. She's like four months old right now, and I can't believe it. I'm just beside myself with oh. this new bundle of joy. <laughs> I so love that beautiful. for you. Oh, that's wonderful. So I got a 27-year-old granddaughter and a four month old <laughs> it's good you get to you get to stay young longer with the, with the babies in your life I have right to. <laughs> yeah I have to. are you are you a grandpa are you a granddad are you a pop pop what what do they call you grandpa I think grandpa, grandpa. grandpa your grandpa yeah. I, I, I like to ask I, mean, I, I like to ask other sir. things too sure. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> sure yeah <laughs> We have we have uh, a whole list of different names that uh, our our artists are called as you know some of them have different names because there's there's mom's side and dad's side and so That's there's right. a grandpa and a, and a pop pop or something like that I I love it well I I, I really appreciate you sharing uh, your story and talking about the Duprees and, and talking about your family a little bit and of course discussing all things malt shop and taking the time to catch up with us. Uh, I know we're looking forward to next year's malt shop cruise. I, I'm sure you guys are too. That's a leading question, obviously. I'm sure you guys are excited for it. Uh, you, you have no idea. You know, yeah, of course, again, that that cruise is so important, not only to people like the Duprees, but fans. Uh, they deserve it. And nobody does a better job than you guys at the malt shop cruises. Nobody. It's amazing. And every year... You do it better than the previous year, which is kind of nice. You know, we've you know we've got Alan Rubens as our fearless leader, our executive producer, and Alan uh, Alan drives us pretty tough, but he's got a vision, you know. And I was saying this in another interview that it's Malt Shop is one of the few cruises that we some cruise. It's not fair. All the cruises are wonderful. Star Vista does six to eight different charters, and they're all unique and they're all beautiful and wonderful and phenomenal fans. But not all of them are about the era the right. music in right. malt shop is about the memory of the era as well not just the i mean the music obviously is the driving factor but we're reliving yeah. those 50s and 60s which were such a key time you know and we're, Absolutely. we're trying to recreate that a bit so uh big shout to alan rubens as executive producer and Ginny morris as uh, as a vice president over there they 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 drive us hard but they do such a great job at what they do i, I couldn't agree more uh, and before I let you go, is there, do you have a message or anything you want to say to, to the fans of the Duprees and the fans on the Malt Shop cruise, anything you'd like to leave them with? Just that I uh, hope they're all uh, being safe, following the, all the restrictions that we have to adhere to. We want everybody to be healthy and uh, enjoy what is a momentous time on the Malt Shop cruise. We have a blast. I know they do too. So yeah. stay safe. Amen to that. Perfect message to all our Malt Shop Memories fans out there and all the other musical fans tuning in. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. It's an honor to sit with the great Mr. Tony Testa of the Duprees today. Whatever you do, be safe, be happy, be healthy, treat each other with kindness, have some compassion. We look forward to seeing you again soon on another video, if not the cruise. Be well, my friend. My pleasure.